Good afternoon, everybody. Um, in this lecture, I will address some of the convergences between educational practices and developments in the orchestral world at the end of the 19th century. Um, just to note, education systems today, I'm professor in Brussels of modern, both modern horn and natural horn, and I notice that education systems today are very much orientated um, towards following up the needs from the orchestral field. In today's brass classes, this often translates into orchestral training in uh, audition training specifically, and students often have one goal, the holy quest for the Stelle, for, the, uh, for the, the orchestral job. So the reply of some schools being to actually, sorry for the word, monkey train the repertoire uh, of a few concertos and some dozens of orchestral excerpts. At the end of the 19th century, however, it would also work the other way around. Um, new developments would be made by the education system, and uh, the musical education system in Brussels was um, actually a good example of that. It was much more of an experimental integrated system that was perfectly fit for its population, followed changes in the professional world, but also influenced new developments. What you see is a quote from uh, Gustave Rollin Jacquemins, who was Minister of Internal Affairs of Belgium in 1878. Um, he was also responsible for the conservatories. Um, it is important to see that the mission of the conservatoires in Europe developed largely during the 19th century uh, from single purpose training centers of performing musicians, as Ignaz pointed out yesterday, with, often with military drill as the solfege classes. Um, it developed to institutions with a much broader appeal. Around 1870, the conservatory had become a powerful tool in an ideological system, uh, the so-called civilizing offensive, which happens all through Europe um, but which was quite particular in, um, in Belgium. Um, it was the bourgeois uh, class that wanted to transform the lower classes into good civilians. And this was often done with very noble but extremely patronizing methods um, that were also used, unfortunately, in colon colonial contexts of the time. In Belgium, this movement was boosted by the liberal governments of the 1870s. Um, that have made the, their education one of their war horses and even instigated, nearly instigated the civil war with that. Um, and their ideology was that the conservatory should act, as you see, with holy fire against the anti-artistic action of easy and vulgar music. If we refer to the concert yesterday, the arrangement of the Highland Quartets fits perfectly into that uh, uh, concept. Um, to raise the standards of music. And it is exactly this aspect that becomes the leading idea in the late 19th century Belgian brass studios. Because under Gevaert, the director of the Brussels Conservatory, the Belgian education system sought for ways to convert brass players from exponents of bad taste, and this is really documented like that in the press, I'm not making things up, exponents of bad taste into civilized musicians. Um, it happened largely under influence of a part of the press and audiences. Um, no, this one. Um, from the 1860s onwards, brass sections were growingly admonished by press and audiences. The main reason seems to be that around that time, mobility has so much improved that people could actually compare Belgian local ensembles with ensembles of international level, and then actually found out that often the brass players abroad played better. Also from the progressive artistic world, in the figure of the Brussels art critic Octave Maus, there was protest against the grotesque repertoire that was often played by brass players, the typical fantasies and so on, that were programmed in the um, in the Brussels Conservatory were admonished uh, by him because he said there was no place for such trivialities in the house of Bach and Beethoven. Um, also, the use, for example, well, there are a lot of examples of this, how um, these orchestral skills and so on um, changed at that time. But one of them, um, to refer to anarchist talk, is the use of hand stopping on the valve horn, which was still common, very common in the 1870s Belgium, was completely uh, blown uh, apart by a press critic at the end of the 1870s. So there was a need for more refinement um, by means of change techniques and repertoire. This is what I'm going to look into in a few minutes. Um, there was a growing need for flexibility. I mentioned already there was a growing mobility, but mobility meant also that musicians 
would have to adapt easy to other situations. They would have to know languages. They would have to know the musical, stylistic language of another country, and so on. Um, and this, of course, in, in, in this search, the aspect of repertoire was extremely important. Um, musicians would have to, and I have to contradict a little uh, the, the, the talk of, of Trevor yesterday, but in Belgium it was the case that musicians would be equally active in military bands, in um, uh, civilian wind bands, and in uh, symphonic um, orchestras. Most musicians would also, as in England, have played two or three instruments at the conservatory, but however they would often only graduate for one of them which would often be the brass instrument, by the way, because that offered better possibilities for their future. Um, another, um, another aspect in this civilizing aspect paradigm of education um, was that um, they didn't want to do this change, they didn't want to implement this change with theoretical courses. Um, Hevaert had, re had remarked that wind and brass players, as you see, wind and brass players would not be tutored. They would play less, well, they would play, they would play less if they would have a course in, in theory. Theoretical courses were not the answer. Um, they were not seen to have an immediate effect on performance. And as we will see in the next slide, the conservatory should be an école d'application, should be a school of application. Um, as a result of this, the first music history course in Brussels was only established in, eight, in 1936, so well after the um, Romantic era. Um, conservatory was an, an école d'application, a, a, a practical institute, um, which had a strongly imposed patronizing academic view on art. And what is important here is that the philosophy of the civilizing offensive should always be taken into account when uh, one looks into um, artistic education at the end of the 19th century. It was a really a very, very big influence on that. Uh, most choices were made by the conservatory direction who had selected teachers who taught as they, as they taught and the teachers had very, very little um, margin to maneuver. Students were seen as servants of the grand tradition, thus they were trained to have perfect orchestral skills and their training always served this larger goal. So it was not about the students, it was about adding, adding the art and, and helping the art to become uh, perfect. In Gevaert's ideology, they would gather in the classroom for several hours a week, they would listen to other students, they would be immersed into the cultural environment of their master teacher, they would be informed by visiting the in-house musical instrument museum from 1877 onwards and walk into the library that had acquired the main works of the old masters. When finally properly educated and civilized, they could become part of the holy temple of musical performance that was the Société des Concerts, the orchestra that was dedicated to performance of music by Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and so on. Um, I didn't want to include this, but seeing the, the lectures of yesterday, I, want, I, I thought it was quite uh, interesting to see. Um, the background of population of brass studios in Belgium, um, we have quite a lot of sources for that, and I especially looked into figures of horn players, but also of trumpet players. Um, what is important here is that this approach was tailor-made for a new public that became to visit the conservatories, that took lessons at the conservatory. So let's have a short look at this. Um, we see that most of the students, the vast majority of students, had an artisan or unschooled worker background. So um, the aspect of professional musicians would, who would have been quite important before in the, in the, in the early days, that completely um, uh, disappeared. Um, mostly the reason I could find for that is that the artisan environments fitted into the profile of the executors, of the people who could actually perform the ideas of other people. And it was their environment. They would be perfect musicians for the new orchestral world, which would say, play well and shut up. That would be the philosophy. Um, <coughs> military students um, made about 25 to 50% of some brass classes, more in the trombone class than in the horn class. Um, these um, were exempt from tuition fees, so they kept the threshold for military students very low. They would be there often for a few years, often during their compulsory military service, and most of them, importantly, did not graduate. You didn't need a diploma to play in a military band, and we see this also with the Belgian musicians that have moved to um, that have moved to the United States, for example, in the Sousa band. Most of them 
most at the most had a second at the second prix, a second price. So we're not highly um, highly skilled in um, in, in Belgium. Um, the overwhelming majority of Bra students had parents. So the aspect of orphanages, there were four orphans on 178 Gentian students that I found. So this was in the Belgian environment not important because the, um, the, the civilizing offensive really sought after kids of artisans. This was really their target, uh, their target population group. Um, look at some, um, let's have a look at my 19th century predecessors in, in Brussels. Um, we have uh, Jean Désiré Artaud, approximately until 1843 until 1866, approximately, well, Merck replaces him already from 1862 onwards, so it's kind of a gray zone. Um, and then Louis-Henri Merck, who had nearly um, 30, more than 30 years of, um, of professorship. Um, one of these um, things is there are key players in Brussels, but both were not Brussels trained, both were not even Belgian, because Artaud was son of a Frenchman, and uh, Merck came in uh, with his German uh, father, who was born in Germany. Um, they were both principal horn of La Monet Theatre, so there was a convergence with the most important orchestra in Brussels at that time, both appointed by Fétis, had an international network, and they were also composers of educational repertoire. So this is, in brief, the repertoire that was used in, um, in, an orchestra, in, in um, the, the context of the horn classes in Brussels. So let's say before 1870, after 1870. Uh, with Artur, we see pretty much what is also used in Paris at that time, with one exception, uh, would be that um, there was, I think, but maybe Anneke can contradict this, um, there was a lot of uh, interest in ensemble playing, uh, ensemble by Gallet, by Dupra, by Fétis um, um, himself, who, who wrote uh, some of the exam pieces. Um, and then there's a complete shift towards repertoire that I see as a proof that um, they saw repertoire more as a way of training students specifically for the orchestra. And in the next page, we will have a look at this. But let's, uh, let's look, first of all, um, Merck didn't like methods. He even writes in his only method, which was the one for Corsac, Sassi, Piston. He writes, yeah, I don't have to write a method because there have been other methods, just read them. Just, just the, we, we don't. I'm going to talk specifically about this six valve horn. Um, the etudes used, typical for the time, he wrote some etudes himself. Arto also wrote some etudes himself, but they were published only after he, um, after he, he retired. So we don't actually know if they have been played. I guess yes, but not. Um, another introduction instigated by Gevaert was the introduction of aria antique, so arrangements often by Gevaert himself of airs um, by Hasse, Handel, Gluck, and so on. There are some examples uh, played by Anneke, by myself, also on, um, on YouTube that you can find. Um, concerti, solo works, talked already in previous talks a lot about uh, Belgian repertoire, so I'm not going to repeat this. And ensemble works that, interestingly, grow to large ensembles. So for example, Dubois, Schaken, and so on, it are full ensemble works for eight horns. Full, uh, um, and there is the secret weapon of the Brussels Conservatory, which was the Fanfare Wagner Wagnerienne, which was a brass ensemble, one of the first, one of the first brass ensembles um, at that time uh, in 1894, um, um, founded by Henri Serra, the um, trombone teacher. So, repertoire after 1870, talking about mainly soft, solemn, and evocative works, which would be a great training for opera, operatic works, and, uh, and, op work, and work in, the, in, in theater orchestras, which was the main target of the, of the students. Um, short melodic pieces and these aria antique, style development, ancient music uh, performance becomes quite important. Belgians took a, quite an important role in this when we also think about Charlier. And uh, for the trumpet, for example, uh, uh, took a, a four role. We'll have uh, sh something shortly after this on, on this. Um, the canon that is um, started with Mozart concertos, Beethoven sonata, Strauss concerto after 1900, which was a big upclassing of repertoire, of course. It has become more thematic, so um, they would address one specific, one specific stylistic or uh, technical topic. And there was a great deal of normation. So um, 
you can actually see, okay, this level, and it's even said in, in some of the pieces, if you want to obtain the first prize, you have to play the high note. There are two notes written on the part. Do you want to, the second prize, the, the normal C, first prize, uh, the, 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 the high C. So there's a, a big emphasis on normation, endurance and intonation training, the things that were also on my slides before. Brief thing about instruments and technique. In Brussels, there was a cohabitation that was different from, um, from Paris. Uh, the natural horn was played until very late. This has been discussed before, but uh, up to the 1920s, uh, there was an obliged test for natural horn in Brussels. Um, but um, in, more importantly, in the education system, the both instruments have been um, used side to side in the same class. So there was no apart class for valve horn and for natural horn. There was this cohabitation, as the French call it, um, uh, between natural horn and valve horn. Um, they would, for the rest, play a surprising amount of two valve horns still with crooks, which was interestingly used by soloists because uh, soloists saw this as a perfect way of combining the benefits of the valve horn with the advantages, the lightness and the legato of the uh, natural horn. So um, the advantage being that the third valve actually adds a lot of resistance to the instrument and the two valve horn being more free. Uh, and in the military because of the weight. Um, but in orchestral and educational context, the three valve horn with crooks would be the standard instrument. Um, side note, in the Société des Concerts, the corsac sassi piston would um, be used. Um, and now something in the, as, as a last um, aspect in this, in this lecture, and which is often overlooked, um, we tend in, in, in our historical brass world uh, to focus largely on equipment in terms of instruments. Um, however, Freudis Rivecker, who has been one of my teachers, big, great Norwegian horn pedagogue, remarks rightfully that 80% of a horn's playing characteristics depend on the player, the mouthpiece, and the interaction between them. Um, which guided me to um, this. Um, on, the, on the picture, we see um, uh, one of the most important exponents of the Belgian horn school had been Louis Victor Dufran, was trained in Ghent, but then later was principal in Chicago, in Cleveland, under Sokolov, teacher of the most important American horn professor of the 20th century, Philip Farkas, to name one of them, uh, was a student of him. And um, there are quite a lot of things um, that we can find by looking into embouchure technique. This could, for me, also solve some of the performance-related questions that we have on Baroque music, um, for example, the bending of notes, um, discussion hand hole, bending, uh, discussion and so on. An aspect that is often overlooked in, in, in my opinion is the aspect of how a mouthpiece is placed, the amount of pivot used and so on, which changes as we all know. The articulation changes the tone colors, changes the endurance and so on. So, um, embouchure technique as trained at the Belgian conservatories, and I found quite some proof of that, became the secret weapon of the Belgian horn players at the end of the 19th century, and that had a huge impact on their performance practice. So what we're looking into, and I'll show a video, I um, took the comfort of not traveling with a horn to, to uh, today, uh, because I could just show a video that is also available on YouTube. Um, just before we, we look at uh, this, this concluding um, video, um, we're talking about a so-called Farkas embouchure system, so with the, the mask, the three points, I think we all know this, with the in upper lip placement. So they place the, the mouthpiece into the lip, and they can do that because they actually use very, very, very small mouthpieces. It's pretty impossible to use the mouthpiece otherwise, even. Um, rim between 15.5 and 17 millimeters, more normal modern mouthpiece would, mouthpiece would be between 17.2 and 19 nowadays. Um, and they would, just, they would adjust the angle and the uh, pivot with a variable obtuse angle. This results in soft articulation, a particular legato and slurs. You will hear this, and I think it refers to much of what Annika has said this morning. Um, very centered and compact sound, a lot of variety in timbre, and very important for the execution of, of ancient music, a prolific high register. 
time, of course. Um, just okay. Um, as conclusions, I could say that um, new requirements were a lot of conclusions to draw from this, and also a great deal of research still to do. And um, we'll start in Brussels a big project on artistic education from next year onwards. Um, conclusions would be that new requirements were mainly imposed by society, politics, and educational system shifts. Um, and the education found answers and even added to the discussion. Orchestral training was learned mainly as, in a buzzword, transferable skills, as part of a complete and fully integrated education system, and not by means of practically just practicing excerpts or concertos. Um, what is for me the most important thing is that orchestral requirements are always in mutual exchange with education methods and that we should keep that in our uh, education system. Thank you very much. Thank you.